So we're going to talk about deadly ptosis. And my objective is to list that when we're done, you'll be able to list at least three potentially life-threatening conditions that might present only with subtle ptosis and how you're going to recognize these conditions. Here is a patient who is in the emergency room. They've had a motor vehicle accident, but it was a minor motor vehicle accident. And the patient uh, is about to be discharged. However, the emergency room physician notes that the patient's pupils are a little bit different in size. And he calls, therefore, an ophthalmology consult. And so the eye movements are normal. Her eye movements are good. She has no double vision. Um, but basically, and both pupils react to the light. And the question is, given that and these fairly subtle findings, um, what are you going to do? And you'll notice that that right eyelid, although it's not super droopy, is slightly droopy compared to the left eyelid. So the question is, in this scenario, what is your diagnostic plan? And we can open the poll. So the, and I, 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 you can see, I think you can see these polling results. So a few people say, oh, send her home. She looks pretty good. Um, a few people want, a few more people want a CAT scan of the head. About a quarter want an MRI of the brain, but 60% want to look at her neck. And, and that is the correct answer. So um, those of you who got that correctly uh, probably have identified this as uh, the patient having a right Horner syndrome. Um, and the Horner syndrome, and this is not the same patient, of course, this person also has a misalignment of the eyes, but a Horner syndrome is characterized by at least two things, and that is relative meiosis of the pupil, but also ptosis. And the ptosis can be subtle, like in the patient we just saw. In fact, it's usually not going to be huge ptosis. So it can be subtle, and you need to be paying close attention. Um, this patient has obvious anisocoria, but if you look at the right upper lid, there is a little bit of drooping of the lid. And so in the patient we just saw, once you identify the, the slight droop, and once you identify the difference in the size of the pupils and that they react okay, you should be thinking, hmm, this could be Horner's. Maybe it's just a little drooping lid and maybe it's physiologic or normal anisocoria. The next step is to look at the patient in the light in the dark. So if the patient has a Horner syndrome and you turn the lights off, well, the, the problem is the sympathetic chain is not working like it should. And so the Horner's pupil, the smaller pupil, won't get big, whereas your normal pupil gets big because that's what it should do in the dark. So if you see an accentuation of the anisocoria when the pupils are viewed in the dark, as we're seeing in the bottom picture here, as opposed to in the light, that is further evidence that this is probably, in this case, a right Horner syndrome. And for those of you neuro-ophthalmology uh, uh, wannabes, this person also has a right abduction deficit. And so in this case, the person has a right Horner syndrome. They're esotropic because of the right abduction deficit. They have a right six nerve palsy. And in this case, that localizes the problem in this patient, in the cavernous sinus, because for a short time in the cavernous sinus, the pupil of motor fibers um, travel with the sixth nerve before they jump off onto the fifth nerve. So the sympathetic fibers going to the iris dilator muscle travel for a short time with the sixth nerve. So if you see a combination of a sixth nerve palsy and a Horner syndrome, it's always going to be the cavernous sinus. So a Horner syndrome. One of the findings you can look for is dilation lag, and I'm gonna to go to my still photographs. So in the upper photograph, you can see, this is the way this patient's pupils looked right after the lights were turned out. So within just a few seconds, and you can see the obvious anisocoria, you can see the obvious, in this case, the more pronounced ptosis. This is about as much ptosis as you're gonna see with a Horner syndrome. But you'll notice that if you keep watching the pupils uh, and you then look, 15, 20, 30 seconds later, the Horner's pupil on the right has actually gotten a little bit bigger. So we call this dilation lag. So the normal pupil dilates quickly as it should in the dark. The Horner's pupil dilates more slowly. So you may or may not see this with the Horner's, but if you do see dilation lag, that's also considered further evidence that this is probably a Horner syndrome. 
Now we can do testing. I think this is um, probably for most of you academic um, because probably most of you don't have cocaine drops. I, I do, we, we have to keep them in a lock box, in a freezer, in a locked refrigerator. And I have to go down and sign them out and get them co-signed with one of the nurses and so on. But we do as a neuro-ophthalmologist, I do have cocaine drops. And the way that cocaine works is it inhibits reuptake of the norepinephrine. So in a normal pupil, it'll cause the pupil to get somewhat bigger. And you can see in this patient, the left pupil is the normal pupil, the right pupil is the horner pupil. And after the cocaine, there is still significant anisocoria. So if this were just physiologic anisocoria, both pupils would dilate to about the same size. If there's at least a millimeter of difference after the cocaine testing, and this is about a 25 to 30 minute wait after you put the cocaine drops in, if you wait, if there's still significant anisocoria defined as more than one millimeter, that's a Horner. So this would be proof, in this case, of a right Horner syndrome, pharmacologic proof. Um, now you can also, because the sympathetic chain is just that, a chain of nerves, it starts in your hypothalamus and goes down the, your spinal cord, comes out, over, goes up over the top of your lung, back up your neck, along the internal carotid artery into the cavernous sinus, and at about the angle of your jaw is where that last synapse is. So that's where the superior cervical ganglion is, about the angle of the jaw. And so you can use another drop, which you probably de almost definitely don't have, hydroxyamphetamine. Um, and again, this is um, academic, but could be a, a question on an exam you might take. Um, and what the hydroxyamphetamine does, it causes release of stored norepinephrine. And so this is used, once you know there's a Horner syndrome, this is used to determine, is it pre-ganglionic or post-ganglionic? And so what that means is that the way the hydroxyamphetamine works, causing the release of stored epinephrine. So if you have a post-ganglionic problem, if the problem is somewhere between the angle of your jaw and your eye, then those axons are dead. There is no stored norepinephrine. So in that setting, you put the hydroxyamphetamine in and you would see what you're seeing right here in the bottom frame. And that is the Horner's pupil does not get any bigger. Why? Because there's no stored norepinephrine. On the other hand, if this were a pre-ganglionic Horner's, the post-ganglionic axons would be intact. There'd be a whole lot of stored norepinephrine. So when you put the, the hydroxyamphetamine in, both pupils would dilate. So again, you're looking for the, the end point is after 25 or 30 minutes, is there still significant anisocoria? If there is, like we see in our patient, then this is a post-ganglionic problem. On the other hand, if both pupils get big, it is a pre-ganglionic problem. Now, there is another drop that you might have, or probably maybe be more likely to have, and that's aproclonidine, also known as iopidine. Aproclonidine is a weak alpha agonist, very weak. So it shouldn't do anything to your normal pupil. So if you look at the, the patient in the upper frame, you'll see the right Horner syndrome, ptosis and meiosis. And you'll notice in the bottom frame, after the aproclonidine, the Horner's pupil now is actually the bigger pupil. And this is because of the, the physiologic uh, mechanism of denervation supersensitivity. So when in the Horner's pupil, since there is no nor, neuro, uh, norepinephrine, there's up regulation of the, neuro, of the receptors and the, uh, the iris dilator muscle becomes supersensitive. So when you put a weak agonist in, the iopidine or um, aproclonidine, it will cause reversal of the anisocoria, reversal of the anisocoria. So those are the pharmacologic issues related to Horner syndrome. And here's the anatomy that I mentioned, starting in the hypothalamus, uh, traveling down the, the brainstem, the cervical spinal cord, coming out around C7, T1, in the ciliospinal center of Budge or Budge Waller, back up along, out actually in the wall of the uh, internal carotid artery, and up into the cavernous sinus, and then forward to the pupil dilator muscle and um, Mueller's muscle in the upper lid, the sympathetically innervated um, uh, elevator of the lid, also the muscle in the lower lid called Horner's muscle. Um, and of course, it also goes to the uh, vasoconstricting fibers in the skin. And so 
you may or may not um, elicit a symptom of anhydrosis, which is a lack of sweating that may or may not be present. So sympathetic chain disruption and worse anisocoria in the dark, a little bit of ptosis. And the question is, well, wait a minute, why is this deadly? And the answer is because one of the common causes or relatively common causes of Horner syndrome can be a carotid artery dissection. And that means that uh, usually after trauma of some sort, it could be a, mo a mild motor vehicle accident and whiplash. It could be someone who's coughing a lot. Um, it could be any sort of neck injury. You can get a little hole in the inner wall of the artery and then blood that's rushing up in the artery can dissect between the inner and outer walls. When that happens, you get blood in the wall and now the lumen of the artery can get very narrow or non-existent, but often what happens is it gets very narrow, very slow blood flow, and then what happens? Blood clots. Then what happens? Blood clots that go to your brain. So you, they can cause stroke and even cause death. You can diagnose this um, with an MRI, uh, MRA, uh, magnetic resonance angiogram, a CTA, which is an, a CT angiogram, but even on a regular MRI, and here's a regular MRI, an axial cut. So here's the bottom of the eyeballs, the nose. Here is the right internal carotid artery. This small circle is the lumen. But this white color in the wall is actually clotted blood. Over here is the normal carotid artery. There should just be a black flow void. This is the so-called crescent moon sign of clotted blood in the wall. And you can actually diagnose this with an MRI. We usually do get an MRA or a CTA because we are really interested in the blood vessels. And the problem is, again, this can kill you. So in one large review study from some years ago, it, it, carotid artery dissections were fairly commonly associated with cranial nerve palsies, transient loss of vision, strokes, and even in death, although it's not that common. But it can kill you or some people think do worse, cause paralysis, et cetera, major strokes. So we have to think about Horner's syndrome in anybody you see with a slight droop of the eye, uh, eyelid, look closely at the pupils, look at the in the light and in the dark because it, a, a, a Horner's syndrome can be very subtle. We also hear about in med school quite a lot about Pancos tumor. I'm not sure if that's a term that's used uh, where you live. But this is when there's a, a lung cancer in the lung apex that can catch those sympathetics as they traverse the, the top of the lung. This is something that I think with, at least in the US with imaging, everybody gets imaged. It's pretty rare that we, um, that we see this. I've probably only seen a few patients over 30 years with a lung cancer because usually the lung cancer these days is diagnosed earlier on. And this is a paper that, that one of my residents um, got together, the first author. She's now in Beirut, Lebanon, practicing. Uh, and she reviewed my series of Horner's patients. This was just published um, last year in the Journal of Neuroophthalmology. We looked at 200, my 200 patients, and we found that about only 18% had some sort of serious pathology. And 138 patients, it was idiopathic, which means that two thirds of the time, we don't find a cause. And I tell the patient, listen, it's not really about the Horner syndrome, it's about the potential causes of the Horner syndrome. So um, the Horner syndrome itself is not a big deal. You get your lids a little droopy, maybe it's a cosmetic problem. It's not gonna cause any other problems. We need to rule out serious pathology, cancer, uh, carotid artery dissection. All right. I'm gonna move on to the next topic. And, and so this one's a tough one. Um, I'll ask the question and I'll tell you a little bit um, about what's going on. So this is a gentleman who's noticed a little bit of drooping of his left eyelid. Although you might look at him and say, well, looks like maybe there's bilateral ptosis. And sure enough, uh, I thought that there was a little bilateral ptosis, but a little worse on the left than on the right. And we looked at his eye movements and although he wasn't complaining of double vision initially, when I had him look downward, he said, oh, you know, that's, that's funny. When I look way down, I do have a little double vision. And when we examined him closely and did our, our appropriate ocular motility and alignment testing, when he looked downward, he had a little right hypertropia, but he looked pretty good everywhere else except for the drooping lids. So we're gonna bring in the second polling question. And the question is, 
what would you do with this guy? So he's in your chair, he's complaining of a droopy lid, but then you notice he has a little ocular motility deficit. And the question is, what's the diagnostic plan for this patient? Um, I would note that he did not have, did not have anisocoria. So did not have anisocoria. So are we gonna observe him? Are we gonna do a CAT scan of his eye sockets? Are we gonna do an MRI of his brain? Are we gonna do an ICE test? And so about two thirds of you chose the ICE test. Um, a few people said observation, CT, a few more said MRI. So I think it, if you're a good test taker, ICE test is pretty easy because number one, it's free and you can do it right there. Um, and so in this case, the reason to do the ICE test as, as two thirds of you probably have correctly surmised is that, well, this certainly could be myasthenia gravis. He's got asymmetric ptosis. He's got a slight motility deficit uh, just when he looks downward. So certainly um, myasthenia would be a possibility. You want to look for variable or fatigable ptosis. You want to look for something called Kogan's eyelid twitch. And you certainly want to check for orbicularis weakness. This is a, a patient who um, uh, had ptosis obviously on the right, not on the left. And, it, and when he looked upward over 10 or 15 seconds, the eyelid just gradually got more droopy. He had uh, levator uh, fatigability or fatigable ptosis. Uh, Kogan's lid twitch sign is a sign where you have the patient usually look from down to up and there's a little twitching of the eyelid and it can occur either even while they're doing that or just while they're sitting there looking at you. Uh, this is another patient, a droopy lid and myasthenia gravis and we watched her, we saw twitching of the eyelid. And don't forget to check orbicularis weakness. And that's very simple. You simply have the patient close your eyes tight, tight as you can, and then try to overcome it. it, it you shouldn't be able to easily overcome uh, closure of the eyelids in someone who's really trying to close their eyes. So it takes, you know, five or 10 seconds to check orbicularis weakness. And if you see a patient with a droopy eyelid and they have orbicularis weakness, it's almost always going to be myasthenia gravis, the combination of droopy lid, and orbicularis weakness. We'll talk about a potential exception, but almost always. You can also do something in the office called a sleep or rest test. This was described as a 30 minute closure of the eyelids. You don't have to go to sleep, you can just rest. And so one of the questions that comes up is, is less than 30 minutes okay? Here's a patient with very obvious, almost complete ptosis on the right. And um, you can see that after 30 minutes of rest, um, and his pupils are pharmacologically dilated, but he certainly has much less ptosis after 30 minutes. So the way you do the test is you simply tell the patient, I'm gonna keep, I'm gonna, I want you to close your eyes. If you go to sleep, that's fine. I don't want you to open your eyes, keep them closed. Um, when I come back in the room, I'm going to ask you to keep them closed till I say, okay, oh, oh, go ahead and open, blink once, and look straight ahead. And then I take a photo and document it. It doesn't last long. So within, a, within probably less than a minute, the left eyelid, in his case, started to get droopy again. There's also the ice test. And I think the ice test is better than the rest test. I've definitely had patients on the, who I've seen who we do a, a short rest test no change, we do a two minute ice test. So it's only two minutes. You do not need to do five minutes or 10 minutes. The ice gets very cold. Two minute, that's the way we, the article we wrote about the ice test. It was a two minute ice application to a droopy lid. You're looking for more than a millimeter of improvement. That is very sensitive and specific. Some people have said, well, doesn't ice just equal rest? And the answer is no. I've definitely seen people with negative rest tests and positive ice tests. You can see the patient with the ptosis in the right upper eyelid. He, we did a two-minute rest test, and after the, I'm sorry, two-minute ice test, and after the ice test, the eyelid opened normally for about 15 or 20 seconds. You can't, you have to look right away. So the, I do this the same way as the rest test. I tell the patient, okay, we're going to put the ice back on for two minutes. I'm going to have you take it off. When you take it off, I want you to blink once and look straight ahead. Don't open your eyes really wide, just normally and then you take a quick photo and I judge the results of the ice test within the first 10 seconds of removing the ice pack. The eyelid heats up very quickly and the droopy lid usually comes back very quickly. There's of course other testing that you can do outside the office depending on where you live. 
There are the acetylcholine receptor antibody tests. Those are, are helpful if they're positive. And about um, 50 to 60% of people with ocular myasthenia will have positive antibodies. The problem is 40 or 50% with ocular myasthenia have negative antibodies. So you cannot rule out ocular myasthenia with a negative blood test. There's something newer called anti-musk antibodies. Frankly, I don't order these anymore. If it's just ocular myasthenia, I've not had anybody have positive anti-musk antibodies um, in that setting. Tensilon testing, adrophonium testing can be done. I haven't done a tensilon test in at least a decade. Um, it's get, gotten a lot harder for us to get the edrophonium and it can stop your heart. Uh, that happened a couple times while I was doing the test. We give atropine to get the heart going. Didn't have any problems, but made my heart rate go way up. Neostigmine bromide is a prostigmine is an intramuscular injection. So it lasts longer than the tensilon. It's been described for use in kids where you, you might need more time to make measurements of their eyelids or of their eye movements. And then single fiber electromyography or EMG can be used as well. I don't think any of these tests rule out myasthenia. I've seen negative tests in all of these categories with a patient who still had myasthenia gravis. But is it deadly? We're talking about deadly ptosis. Well, we know that a fair percentage of people who present to the ophthalmologist with ocular myasthenia can, be cut, can develop generalized myasthenia. So depending on what you read, anywhere from 30 to 70% of people who present with new symptoms of ocular myasthenia can develop generalized myasthenia over the next weeks or months or the, up to the next couple of years. And of those patients, a fairly significant percent can develop myasthenic crisis, which can include respiratory distress and before immunotherapy, steroids and other immunosuppressive uh, agents there was a 75% mortality. Now, nowadays, as long as the diagnosis is made and you have immunosuppressions like corticosteroids, the death rate is very low, thankfully, but it can be deadly if you don't have a right diagnosis or if the patient somehow can't get treated. And when patients say, oh, how bad can this droopy eyelid be? I said, well, if you're on a desert island and there is no treatment available, you could die from suffocation from involvement of your diaphragm muscle. So it can be deadly. All right, this is another, we're moving on to a different category. This is a gentleman who presented to our resident clinic with droopy lids. So you can see he's got bilaterally symmetric drooping of his eyelids. There was really, we asked of course questions about uh, myasthenia. He really didn't have any other symptoms of systemic myasthenia. Um, and really, he was just there because he had heard that we could fix his eyelids, and he wanted them fixed. And so he's 21 years old. He's a healthy guy. He's got no other problems. Um, however, when we looked at his eye movements, his eye movements were not normal. It seemed like in, they were a little bit limited, more maybe moderately limited, in every gaze. So up, down, left, and right, they just didn't move as well as we'd expect a healthy 21-year-old guy to move. So the question, and we can have the poll, is what are we gonna do with this patient? So are we gonna do an ice test? Are we gonna do an EKG, an electrocardiogram? What about CAT scan of the eye sockets or MRI of his brain? All right, so this is, we got a, pr a pretty big mixed, mixed bag here. So about 20% of you said an ice test. I wouldn't say that's wrong, why? Because you can do it right away. Um, and myasthenia is in the differential diagnosis um, with this bilateral ptosis and bilateral ophthalmoplegia. So I certainly don't fault anyone who said ice test. Um, about 30% said electrocardiogram or EKG. Um, a fair percent said CAT scan of the orbits. That would probably be my, my last choice. Um, MRI of the brain, 41% uh, actually said. Now I'm not sure what you're thinking about. I've never seen a patient with, an, with a lesion on his MRI that caused symmetric ptosis and symmetric ophthalmoplegia. Um, but the, the most important test in this guy, let's say you've done your ice test, which is quick and easy, is the EKG. So the, the, this is a fairly classic presentation of a condition called chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia. This is a symmetric, slowly progressive ptosis and ophthalmoplegia. It's a mitochondrial um, problem, and it, but it can be either mitochondrial DNA or 
somatic DNA mutation that codes for a mitochondrial protein. So it's a problem with a mitochondrial electron transport chain, CPEO, chronic progressive ophthalmoplegia. Here's a different patient, obviously, um, with over the years, the fairly young guy, over the years, over these six years, you can see his lids gradually becoming more droopy. It's not showing his eye movements. Typically, these patients don't have double vision, despite having ophthalmoplegia. And that sometimes can help characterize, distinguish it from myasthenia. They usually do not have double vision. He has bilateral ptosis, as you can see, and he has somewhat limited eye movements, especially in elevation. And he was diagnosed actually with CPEO by an ophthalmologist who lives some hundreds of miles away from me and was actually in town and wanted another opinion. And I said, well, what about your EKG? And he said, oh, well, the ophthalmologist didn't order an EKG. And I said, oh, well, but he said, but I just had an EKG because I was having a, a surgical procedure on, on his abdomen. And they said I had a bundle branch block. And I said, oh, well, that, that's a, you need a cardiologist and you need a new ophthalmologist. And so he has CPEO and the, what's called the Kern-Sayer variant. So this is a problem that typically occurs in young men, teens, 20s. They have a mitochondrial problem uh, that causes the CPEO picture, but they can also get a, have RP-like changes in the fundus. And importantly, they can have uh, and is it deadly is the question. And the answer is it can be because it can cause cardiac conduction deficits. So it can start with things like a bundle branch block, but it can, can, pro it can progress without pacemaker to, to complete heart block and death. So in this case, in, the, in this young person, the most important test is an EKG because if the, he has EKG conduction abnormalities, you can save his life with a pacemaker placement. So yes, this can, this is another case of ptosis. It's typically bilateral and symmetric, but the ptosis is gonna be the chief presenting complaint of a potentially deadly condition. So this woman has a droopy lid. And you can see that her eye movements don't look that bad, but when she, and she denied double vision, but when she looked upward, she said, oh, when I look way up, I see two lights way up there. And she had a little right hypotropia, a little right hypotropia. And otherwise, she looks pretty good. So ptosis, she, had, um, she did not have any anisocoria. And so we could put the polling question in. What's our plan for this patient? Ice test, MRI, MRA of the brain, uh, lid surgery, levator resection, or a cerebral angiogram. Actually, the majority of you picked a, a, a test to look at the blood vessels. So MRI, MRI brain, about half, and cerebral angiogram, a third. A few people said do surgery on the eyelid. That would not be the right answer. Uh, ice testing, well, again, I wouldn't fault you for doing ice testing. Could this be myasthenia? Sure. We already talked about myasthenia, though, but if you saw this patient, I, certainly ice testing would be reasonable. She's got, I mean, she really looks fairly like the other guy, except he couldn't, his eye didn't move down all the way. But this is a new topic, as most of you ascertained, and she actually has a very right third nerve palsy. In fact, she has a superior division right third nerve palsy. Her levator is affected and her superior rectus is slightly affected. So she's got some ptosis. And when she looks up, the right eye doesn't move up quite as well as it should. So she develops a relative right hypotropia. And so in her case, we're concerned about a right third nerve palsy. And we wanna look at her uh, blood vessels in particular because we're worried about the possibility of an aneurysm. Now, usually when we think about third nerve palsies, we think about pupil involvement and aneurysms, but this is a very mild third nerve palsy. And so I'm gonna not go right to cerebral angiogram. I'm gonna go right, I'm gonna go to MRI, MRA of the brain, or CTA, depending on what you have available first. If you don't have, and I've been in, in programs that don't have MRI, MRA, or CTA, all they have is cerebral angiogram, then I'll get the angiogram. The angiogram is the gold standard. So if the patient, if you're very 
convinced that this could be an aneurysm, if you're very worried, like let's say it's a 30-year-old healthy person with pain, and the MRI or an MRA or CTA are normal, then I'm going to get an angiogram. But don't, don't forget, depending on who's doing the angiogram, there can be a 1% or 2% risk of stroke from the angiogram. So the angiogram is invasive. It's, I have not had to order in my hospital an angiogram in, in 10 years because we find the aneurysms on non-invasive testing. Here's what we're looking for. So here's the relevant anatomy. Here's the circle of Willis with the uh, artery being cut away. Here are your optic nerves coming back from your globes. Here's the third nerve as it runs right under the origin of the posterior communicating artery. Um, and so in what can happen is, of course, in that setting, sorry, I did it again. Um, hold on. Uh, in that setting, if an aneurysm forms right here, like in this MRA, this multi-lobulated aneurysm, you can imagine how one of the first things that this aneurysm is going to push on is the third nerve. And this can kill you, of course, if it ruptures. So here's a patient, and the question is, are these third nerve palsies deadly? Well, here's another individual, older individual, diabetic, hypertensive. His pupils are normal. His eye, he clearly has a third nerve palsy. It's not quite complete, but it's, his, eye, his left eye really doesn't move down. It, it abducts okay. He's got almost complete ptosis. Um, his eye does not move up or in or down. So an almost complete pupil sparing third nerve palsy. So the question is, could that be deadly? And then here's another patient with a little different story, a 60 year old gentleman. He also has a left third nerve palsy. So he's got a little bit of ptosis. His left eye just doesn't move quite all the way down. It doesn't adduct fully. Look how well his right eye adducts. And then look at the left. And it doesn't elevate quite normally. So he has a partial left third nerve palsy with pupil involvement. His left pupil is a little bigger than the right. And the question, is it deadly? So the answer is, and what I'm teaching now, I, we used to talk a lot about the rule of the pupil. And this schematic is a cartoon is, is to try to make the point that the pupillary motor fibers travel in the outer part of the third nerve. So that these blue, light blue fibers are the pupillary motor fibers. And so when you have a compressive lesion like an aneurysm, what is it going to do? It's going to push on the outer part of the nerve and cause the pupil to be involved. Whereas if you have a microvascular third nerve palsy and it's causing a problem in the center of the nerve, it can spare these fibers because there's other collateral blood supply. The problem is that there's a lot of rule caveats, there's corollaries. And so my current teaching about third nerve palsies is that if you see a patient and you, if you're not a neuro-ophthalmologist, you probably don't see a heck of a lot of third nerve palsies. Just get the imaging. I don't care if the person's diabetic and 70, get the MRI, MRA, or the CTA. If you don't have non-invasive imaging, that's a tougher question. Uh, but if you have non-invasive imaging, vascular imaging, where there's no risk to the patient, I would get an MRI, MRA, or a CTA in anybody with a third nerve palsy because the risk of not doing that and getting a patient who happens to have a partial third nerve palsy with pupil that looks okay, like our woman with uh, we showed you the video of, she had an aneurysm um, and she could die of that aneurysm if you don't find it. So my teaching is if they have a third nerve palsy, get imaging, it's simple. And I will tell you a, a sad story about this patient. We did get imaging. So I saw her on a Friday morning. Um, I, I called the MRI place myself and said, listen, I got a patient. She may have a mild third nerve palsy. Um, I'm worried that it could be an aneurysm. She needs to be imaged today. She had no pain. She had no pupil involvement. And they called me at five o'clock in the afternoon and said, she's claustrophobic. We're going to bring her back Monday morning and with some anesthesia. And I said, oh, all right. So I talked to the patient. I said, any headaches, any problems, let me know over the weekend. If not, let's get the MRI. Monday afternoon rolls around. I call the patient. No answer. Finally find out. 
She, on Saturday, Sunday morning, she got a bad headache. She went to the emergency room and she died uh, of a ruptured aneurysm. So lesson learned, toughly. Uh, nowadays, we don't allow that to happen anymore. So evaluation of third nerve palsy, urgent MRI, MRA or CTA. If that's normal, but the suspicion of an aneurysm is high, obtain catheter angiogram. And patients over 50, don't forget about giant cellulitis. I'm sorry my image is overlapping. That's supposed to be animated. That's not working either. Um, in patients over 50, always ask about symptoms of giant cell arteritis. And depending on where you live, of course, that's more or less common. But that can cause a third nerve palsy. And that's something that also can blind you. So you think about giant cell arteritis. If a microvascular etiology, so blood pressure, diabetes, um, of course, control those risk factors. And in that setting, the third nerve palsy should improve spontaneously over three months, 100% of the time. So in summary for deadly ptosis, even subtle, seemingly isolated ptosis could be, could be the first sign of a life-threatening condition. So pay close attention to the pupils. I call the fellow travelers, look closely at the pupils for Horner syndrome or maybe third nerve palsy. Look closely at the eye movements for chronic progressive external ophthalmoplegia, myasthenia, or third nerve palsy. And don't forget to look for eyelid signs of myasthenia, variability, and fatigability, and keeping in mind that although these things usually are not gonna kill you, there are things that can kill you, like aneurysms causing thirds, respiratory distress causing myas or with myasthenia, um, carotid artery dissection, and Horner syndrome, and cardiac conduction defects in CPEO. So that is the summary uh, and goodbye, happy holidays, and um, see you at the next Neuro Ophthalmology Orbis CyberSite webinar.